Welcome to Take Fountain. My guest today is Will McCormack, a well-known writer. Hello, Will. How are you? I'm good, Ella. How are you? It's nice to see you. It's so good to see you. Um, Will and I met um, when we're out walking and um, and we we did that terrible Hollywood thing where where um, the friend that I was walking with said, so, you know, what do you do? And Will said, yeah. I'm a writer. And uh, and I said, oh, anything I'd know. And he went, oh, yeah, <laughs> Toy Story 4. And I went, bow, 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 bow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, of course, you know, on subsequent days, uh, you said to me one day, oh, my short film has been released. It's only 12 minutes. So it's on Netflix. You should watch it. Mm -hmm. So I came home and I immediately logged on to If Anything Happens, I Love You. And um, like the world, I cried and and thought just what an extraordinary 2D animation it was. But within days, it had just attracted the most enormous attention, 55 million hits on TikTok. It's uh, rated 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, uh, and it was number one internationally on Netflix. So congratulations. So let's let's start there and, and talk about talk about your film. How's it going? Oh my God, it, it's been, um, you know, I've been doing this a long time now and uh, it's been, you know, making this short film with the crew that I had the privilege of making it with and having it released in the world and, and having the response has been the single most rewarding and cathartic experience I've ever had as a storyteller. It's just yeah. been phenomenal. So we this have very low expectations and something about the film struck a chord internationally. And, um, you know, we were buoyed, I think, by the TikTok uh, phenomenon that happened, but I think it just struck a chord with people all over and, um, that we were not prepared for, but you know, we're delighted by the response. This is a story of a couple who lose their child in a school shooting. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very sensitive and it, and it wasn't necessarily released at a time when you would think that it would necessarily have an impact. Is that right? Well, yeah, it's, there's, there's a pandemic. So there, there haven't, you know, there haven't been, thank God, any school shootings this year because schools aren't open. So, yeah. um, but I do think that, you know, um, school shootings have been happening with such regularity and um, they become so part of American culture that I think it's a fear that kids and parents walk around with all the time. And something about this film struck a chord. I also think that there's been a pandemic and people are sort of cooped up in their homes and they're feeling like they were looking for some sort of uh, relief and some sort of release. And I do think with this pandemic, I think this, the, the movie is about a school shooting, but I think it wraps around its arms around all types of grief. I mean, I've had people reach out to me who've lost children to gun violence, but I've also had people reach out to me and say, uh, I lost my father during this pandemic and your film spoke to me in a way that it touched on grief that I had bottled up. So yeah. uh, it is about a school shooting, but I think it, the movie somehow has embraced all forms of grief because lots of people have responded to it and not just people who've lost loved ones to gun violence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was certainly the case for me, but as an Australian, I think where it strikes me every time is I don't understand why somebody's right to have a gun that then allows this to happen is not something that people are screaming about. I just, I, I don't, I don't understand that. We had one mass shooting in Australia and our then prime minister just said, that's it, that's enough. Everybody's got a hand in their guns. It's no longer allowed. It doesn't mean hunters don't have guns or farmers don't have guns, but it just means this generalized acceptance of, of particularly these semi-automatic guns. Um, mm. Have you been have you been contacted by any of the various groups um, that are, are trying to change the, the law? Well, we we were um, we partnered with Every Town for Gun Safety early on in the project. Right. And, uh, you know, our executive producer, Laura Dern, has worked closely with them, and so has our other executive producer, Jamie Lemons. But, you know, as a, as a storyteller, telling a story about um, 
this type of tragic loss, uh, it's a very serious subject. So we took it very seriously. So I wanted to vet the story with Every Town for Gun Safety and um, make sure that it felt authentic um, to this type of loss. And they loved the script and they loved the story and they loved the animatics. So they became a partner and a friend to the film very early on. And then of course, we also connected with um, lots of people who had lost loved ones to gun violence because it's just a very difficult thing to try to wrestle with narratively. So we were really, really thorough in, in writing the script. We, we, the script is only 12 pages long and we, it took a year to write. Right. You know. Are you so. and Michael Govier, is that how I say his name? Uh, Govier, yeah. Govier, yeah. Wrote the, you co-wrote the script together. Yeah. Uh, what was the trigger? What was that moment where you thought, ah, I'm going to write about this? It's a good question. I mean, Michael and I actually met in an acting class in the Valley. And uh, we're both writers and we would meet for avocado sandwiches at Griffith Park and talk about, you know, things we were writing. And um, he's a very creative, smart, soulful guy. And uh, we were both interested in writing about grief and loss that we've had in our own lives. And um, we kept reading about, you know, uh, mass shootings and, and the recursive tragic gun violence in America. We thought, what would it be like to write about the loss of a child? And uh, Michael sort of had this beautiful Jungian visualization of um, the shadows that represent the pain and agony that we as human beings can't reach in times of pain because we're sort of disconnected. Mm -hmm. And I thought, God, what a beautiful representation of grief that there are these souls that we are trying to reach. And through hopefully through the grief process, we are connected with them. And that darkness is able to connect with the light. and We're able to become whole again, which is easier said than done. But it really started because of what was happening in the world. Us wanting to write about loss and specifically this type of loss. But then also this beautiful image um, of these souls or shadows that represent the pain that we can't reach uh, because we're in so much agony. So um, it was sort of a pastiche of those things. So um, so you would you get together face to face to write or do you write separately or do you use do you use a shared platform where, you know, you're working at the same time? How does it work for you? What's your process? This movie we wrote side by side and um, uh, I, I, I love to, I write alone too, but I love to collaborate and, uh, you know, film is a team sport and, um, we really just found a rhythm and, um, you know, we also watched hundreds of animated short films and I've worked at Pixar and I'm sort of an animation geek. So visually we were sort of on the same page, um, from the get go, there's a, uh, Belgian movie that won the Academy Award in, I can't remember what year, 2003 or something, um, called Father and Daughter. And that was a huge inspiration for us visually and how lean and spare it was. But uh, we just were really in rhythm right from the beginning. You know, you get lucky sometimes making a film. Uh, usually you don't, but sometimes you do. And I was really lucky when I met Michael because we were, we were just in lockstep from the moment yeah. we met creatively. I think um, I really like the image of the the the, the blue uh, paint on the wall in the garden, mm -hmm. um, which represented one thing when it was damaged and another thing when it was repaired and then another thing, you know, mm -hmm. it's those those kinds of things. And I can see I can feel your friendship in in the film, mm -hmm. you know, which is a beautiful thing. But you also, I mean, you, as you say, filmmaking is a team sport. You worked with Rashida Jones mm -hmm. uh, on on Toy Story 4. Mm -hmm. Is that the kind of thing where you also you work side by side or or is that uh, is there a different process when you're working on something that is much, let's say, much larger scale? Rashida is my oldest friend in the world. And we um, sort of gave each other the courage to become professional screenwriters. I think we were both um, insecure about becoming professional screenwriters. So we were really um, by each other's side. We wrote a movie, the first film we wrote together was called Celeste and Jesse Forever. Mm -hmm. And it went to 
Dance and Sony Pictures Classics released it, and it really gave us a, a writing career. But we really gave each other the courage to write. Um, I, I do both now. I just wrote a movie for Disney alone, and I'm writing another film right now with Michael, and Rashid and I are producing together. So, you know, really it's finding someone who is passionate about the same type of storytelling and someone who's willing to do the work because, you know, screenwriting is not glamorous. It's a grind and it's a day-to-day -day, um, uh, undertaking, but it's something that I, I really love. Like my, I, you know, other than being with my son and my wife, like my, my favorite part of the day is having coffee and getting into the office and getting into yeah. the work. I really love the, the grind and the sort of daily, uh, just it's it's every day and you have to stay at it so i i love the the sort of marathon aspect of it yes yes well it, it looks like you're going to be nominated for an academy award uh this season is that uh, is that where we're up to i i i love to hear you say that <laughs> i i don't know uh we would gladly accept an academy award nomination if that were to happen but um to be on the netflix platform and it to suddenly have your tiny animated short film that played well at film festivals, but to suddenly have it in hundreds of millions of homes is a surreal experience. And uh, we're super, super grateful to have the opportunity to play all over the world. And it doesn't happen a lot for short films. You know, yeah. usually, Ella, if a short film gains any notoriety, it precedes a major motion picture like Incredibles or you know, short films only precede giant blockbusters. So to have a standalone 2D animated short film about grief, have this type of play in the world is really, was really phenomenal. It was just such an incredible feeling as a storyteller. Yeah. Is this the, the hard work plus the magic? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, I think it's for me, I, I'm always trying to, and this is not virtuous in any way, I'm always trying to tell stories that matter to me um, because they're really hard to tell even when you are connected to them. Mm. But also, I feel like that's my real capital. You know, Rashida's father, Quincy, once told me that the reason why he's so successful is that he always uh, worked on things that he loved. So I also think that that's like my greatest chance of success is to bring whatever I am and whoever I am to the work because that's actually my greatest um, opportunity to succeed. So I think that there's, there's, there's a little bit of luck, but I really think that the uh, entertainment business is about endurance and it's about showing up and it's not about getting too up when things go well, which is not often and not getting too down when things don't go well. It's yeah. about continuing to show up to the work and being your best friend and your own champion, which takes a lot of time to cultivate that. Yeah. I mean, I swear, if, if I were a dog, my name would be Sorry, Ella. <laughs> That's great. That's great. But, I, but I can say this now, and I hope it's not annoying or um, corny in any way. But I really do look back on all of my alleged failures and they informed me in the work and they created who I am now. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and now I'm now I'm older. I mean, I'm in the middle of my life. And when I when I do have a little bit of success, like if anything happens, I love you or some other projects that I've been able to, to squeak through. I really have more gratitude for them because I know how hard it is and they, they feel better. Mm. Well, look, none of us were born doing what we're doing now, you know? So let's let's explore that. As as a child, did you want to be a filmmaker, an actor? Because you're a slashy, like you're, a, you're an actor, writer, producer, you know, you do it all. Was that the dream? When did that kick in? You know, when I was really young, I wanted to play shortstop for the Yankees, but I, you know, Derek Jeter had that job and I, I wasn't quite good enough, but I loved uh, stories and poems and plays when I was little. Um, I, I won a poetry contest in my town. Um, 
uh, for the local paper when I was a boy. And then I remember sort of buckling and caving from the pressure at like age nine, because everyone said, oh, you're going to be a writer. You're going to be a writer. Uh, and it wasn't until college when I uh, acted in a lot of plays and really found a theater community that was warm and embracing. And I thought like, oh, I could, I could make a life out of story. I didn't quite know how yet. And then I became a professional actor. I did lots of theater and I did some films and I did lots of pilots and TV shows. And uh, my acting career wasn't quite as fulfilling as I wanted it to be. So um, I was also drinking a lot and I, uh, I gave up drinking and I, I uh, became a professional screenwriter. And I said, I'm gonna write every day until I sell something. And um, I sold a movie with Rashida and I sold a pilot. We sold a pilot to Showtime. And then suddenly one year uh, I became a professional screenwriter. So it was a dream I had forever, but um, I was always terrified of it. And I was always, whenever I sat down to write, I thought I was writing like other people. But the more you stay at it, one day you'll write something uh, that sounds like you. And one day you'll write a page that sounds like you. And one day you'll write a screenplay that sounds like you. Um, and for me, it was just hard work. And it was something that I was dying for. That, that um, because, you know, authenticity, but that way of mm -hmm. saying you'll write something that sounds like you, that's, um, I mean, I, I, that really resonates for me. That's, that's how I discovered acting. I mean, I'd been a voice actor and a journalist and all sorts of things. And I, I stood on a stage for the first time and, uh, and I thought, oh, this is what breathing is like. Yeah. So you, you just discover that and, and then you're off on another tangent. Tell me, the other thing is, um, I, I have found when, I, when I'm looking at, at doing something, for example, when I was moving over here, I wrote down a, a spreadsheet of all the pros and cons of the big decisions I'd made in my life and, and what I had done prior to that that made them work hoping to find some kind of action or idea or something. But it turned out that it was a person. Every time something great or meaningful or um, on a professional level, it was always somebody who came into my life who gave me a little bit of a lift or a nudge or something. Have you, have you found that in your experience or has it been a solo ride for you? No, I've definitely had help along the way and, and people who believed in me. And, um, you know, my, my mom was the first person who told me um, that I could be a writer. And I remember that as a little boy. And my mother's also a beautiful writer. And I would find little poems and scraps of paper around the home. And she, you know, gave me stories and, and introduced me to literature. But um, I think everyone's got to find the, their, their tribe, right? You've got to find people along the way that that, that you believe in them and they believe in you because it is a lonely, lonely road filled with a lot of rejection. And you've got to find those little moments that feel like reprieves where you feel like full and you feel connected to yourself and you feel like you can do it. But, uh, you know, Rashida was also, I think we were that for each other where we told okay. each other like, yeah, hey, yeah. we can be professional screenwriters, you know, we can do this. So, and I find that now in my partnership with Michael, you know, um, I have one rule that when I'm collaborating, I, 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 and maybe this comes from my own shortcomings or insecurities as a, as a human being, but I, 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 want, I don't want anyone ever to feel like any idea that they pitch is stupid. Mm -hmm. Everything is part of the process and all ideas are welcome. And I want everyone to feel like the best version of themselves when they work with me. So I do think that I, I, I do think that if I am good at anything, it's I am good at collaborating because I love collaboration and I want to hear your ideas and you make me better and I make you better. And if I wanted to be a solitaire, I wouldn't have gotten into film because this is what we do. We collaborate. We're better because of each other. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's why I came to L.A. Mm -hmm. because my career up until then had been very solitary, you know, as a journalist, radio, TV presenter, a voiceover artist, although, you know, voice, of course, you are collaborating with your, your writers and your engineers and so on, but it was the opportunity to be something more that I, I think is so exciting about this place, because Hollywood, you know, it'll eat you up. It, it's a hungry beast, right? Well, it'll kill you. Yeah. Um, how, have you, how have you found the pandemic? Has writing been 
a pleasure or a curse? I, I love to write. So, I mean, and I'll write anytime, anywhere. I, I, I have a, a office basement here and um, I was lucky to go into this time with a couple of good jobs. So um, I'm able to, I was able to work all year. Yeah. My wife is an actor and she's on a television show and she wasn't able to, to shoot. So she goes back, I think in February. So for her, I think she went a little stir, stir crazy because I don't think she was connected creatively. But um, for me, I was able to work all year and I was also able to be with my wife and my son every single day. Usually I would have to fly uh, for work and I was able to be with my family every single day. So that's also yeah. a blessing and I having a good a... time to get back. Yeah, I think... I think that's been a real gift in so many in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Although, although just like tangent, I was reading this morning that um, there is a um, oh god, a man who does. Um, I can't think of the word. It was just in my head. A vasectomy. A man who does vasectomies says that his office is busy all day. Um, and, and he, he said, it's because during the pandemic, people spending time with their children are like, no. <laughs> and I thought, no, it's not the romantic notion. I wanted it. I wanted the fathers to say, oh, so this is what parenting's like. <laughs> well, I'm fortunate because we have a baby and he's very sweet, but I can imagine he'll be driving me bonkers any moment. Never, never. Yeah. He's absolutely gorgeous. I can thank attest you. to that. Thank Listen, you. thank you so much for your time. I wish you every every luck, both with uh, this. Uh, if anything happens, I love you because, I mean, even the name just makes my heart, just drops me into the heart space. Um, I uh, look forward to seeing what you do next um, with and writing with Michael again, Michael Govier. Thank you. Yeah, we're working on another um, animated film now and... Um, Thanks so much for having me. It was so fun to talk to you. I really appreciate it. That's a pleasure. Thanks, and I'll see you on the walk. All right, great. See you okay. soon. Bye. All right, bye. You've been listening to Tate Fountain with Ella James. For more, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. You can subscribe to the podcast at your favourite podcasting app. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.